what a beautiful anthem that was. It is a truly blessing. And um, I missed very much to go back and have those wonderful practice together on every Thursday evening. If you read at the beginning part of Philippians chapter 3, especially starting from verse 2, Paul warns Christians by using a term, a dog. And he says, be aware of the dogs. And it sounds more offensive than actually it is. But dogs, or what self-righteous Jews often call the Gentiles, who did not observe their law. So St. Paul is using the Jewish, uh, Jew, Jews' own term against them. And in order to make what to him was a fundamental point, that the Gentile didn't have to become Jews to become Christians. Nor is Paul, as boastful as he may sound, if any person think he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. It's easy to mock wealth, power, lineage, any form of purely human achievement if you yourself don't have any. Paul, I think, is trying to make clear that his reason for disparaging Jews and Judaism is not because he lacks status. After all, he is a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. And as a matter of fact, of no less a tribe than that of Benjamin, which even though small tribe, was the tribe that gave Israel is first king. Men from the tribe of Benjamin were traditionally the first one into battle, accompanied by the war cry, after thee, O Benjamin, and they engaged the war bravely. In other words, Paul's criticism of Jews and Judaism is not that of an outsider. And I must say that I many times and always prefer criticism from the inside. I like the world leaders who are underwhelmed by his cabinets, bristling with self-importance. I like Protestants who know there is no substitute for the Catholic mass. I like socialists who grieve at the seemingly endless arrows of the left. I like capitalists who knows that unemployment has always been the scandal of capitalism. I like patriots who are occasionally moved out of the love of country to write an honest confession. And I like parents who never demand equal return from their children, imposing moral obligation upon them by boasting how sacrificial they've always been. As all the first Christians were as Jewish as Jesus himself, Paul is not against all Jews, nor against all Judaism. He has no quarrel with the prophets, but alongside the prophetic strain in Judaism, there was a legalistic and moralistic strain, which in Paul's day had gained much upper hand and power, both in politics and in religion. It is this legalism and moralism that Paul is attacking. You cannot earn your salvation. He is saying, forget, O oh, brothers and sisters in Church of Philippi, any notion that would see any exterior sign as a proof that your inner life is in a good shape. For nothing external can transform selfishness into 
unselfishness. And if we fail in love, you know, we fail in all other things. Even though I give my body to be burned, the very stuff of heroism, but have not love, I gain nothing. 21 centuries later, we still tend to lean towards a religion that is legalistic and moralistic. You bet your life we do, and for the same old reasons. In order to prove ourselves and everybody else that morally we are living all right, and not to do so by avoiding the question of inner motivation. But before going into that issue, let us stay for a moment with Paul's reason to have confidence in the flesh, his hereditary claim to status. You know, a while ago, I heard a story that lingered around on Harvard University campus. An enthusiastic and young Christian college freshman met an elderly lady of an Boston's for one of the Boston's first families. And this young man asked her whether she had been born again. Young man, she replied, if you are born on Beacon Street in Boston, you don't have to be born again. After the O Benjamin, after the O Beacon Street, or into a more updated version where the Kennedys get all the caviars, the McCormacks get nothing but scroll. We laugh, but it's not so funny. This persistent claim to superiority through heritage, it accounts for so many, the maskers that happen in the synagogues in Pittsburgh and in many other cities. It accounts also for the mass shooting in Dayton, Ohio and all El Paso, Texas. It also accounts for the glass ceiling effect that so many women and the minority and the marginalized experience in our society. I heard a story from my friend's father, a physician in Connecticut, and he had a friend in New Haven, an old Jewish surgeon, who told him that he wasn't allowed to intern in one of the great Jewish hospitals in the New York City because he was a, of Russian rather than a German descent. A purity of descent is only a fragile reason for having confidence in the flesh because we merely want to be winners in America with a system that is based on ruthless competition. But why? Why is it so necessary for us to be a winner? In our heart of hearts, do we think that we are losers? Sometimes I think so. Human beings are too anxious and anxiety born as the sparks fly upward. I think that on a scale of one to 10, perhaps many of us see ourselves at minus three, and that includes me. I think that on a scale, so we, we seek to compensate and endlessly and vainly. For it is a fact of life that our capacity to reassure ourselves is outstripped by our need for reassurance. The higher we rise, the more exposure we experience. We are too anxiety-born 
as the spark fly upward. And when the purity of descent and wealth and power and nationalistic patriotism fail to reassure us, we are able to turn to religion. But sadly, many times to a religion of legalism and moralism. Listen again to St. Paul's description of himself before he met Christ. He said, as to the law, I am a Pharisee. As to zeal, I am a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness under the law, I am blameless. Karl Barth, a very famous theologian in the field of systematic theology, he wrote, most Christians today go to church to make their last stand before God. I think he meant that they go to church to deify, not God, but their own righteousness and their own virtues. They seek salvation through good work and performing good behaviors. That's the moralism and that's the legalism deeply seated even in today's Christianity. But in all honesty, we have to tell ourselves that such an effort don't work. The more you seek perfection, the less you seek God, and less you seek neighbors. Because seeking perfection is too self-absorbing an enterprise. That's why Luther said, good works don't make a person good. So why do we keep on trying? One reason has to do with ambition and motivation. I think we fear that if we give up our ambition, we will lose our motivation. Consider this story. A young boy on an errand for his mother had just bought a dozen eggs. Walking out of the store, he tripped and dropped the whole sack and all the eggs broke and the sidewalk was a mess. The boy tried not to cry. A few people gathered to see if he was all right and to tell him how sorry they were in the midst of the works of pity. One man stepped up and handed a boy a dollar bill. Then he turned to the group and said, I care for this boy with one dollar worth. How much do the rest of you care? Now I would like to ask you, do you think a boy lost his motivation to seek to mend and to recover his mistake? with this man's caring response to his awful situations? Do you think St. Paul lost his motivation embraced by Christ's presence and commissioning him with a new life vocation? Do you think the prodigal son lost his motivation to love and honor his father again being wrapped in his, in his father's loving arm. Listen to Paul one more time. He said, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. 
I guess Luther was right. Good works don't make a person good, but a good person does a good works. After the O oh Benjamin, we may outcry as we re-engage in a spiritual battle, starting from today, perhaps another week. Perhaps we are saying, after thee, wealth and power and fame. After thee, O oh virtue, or oh righteousness. I say, no, no. Rather, we need to say, after thee, O oh Christ Jesus. And after thee and with you forever and ever. As we commissioned us to go back and reach out people, those who need our help and encouragement, embrace them with God's loving arm as we are the expression of God's love. May God bless every one of us as we go back to everyday life. Amen.